Um, so good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Hudson. I will begin by setting the slides up correctly. Bear with me just a moment. Right, here we are. So today's webinar um, is on quite a broad topic, uh, managing drug and alcohol misuse at work. So I'm going to narrow this down to looking at um, line managers responsibility and how they can help with the policy and processes. I'm Sarah. Um, I am a business partner for Clover HR. I'll give you a bit of an introduction into to Clover, uh, just so you know the team. Um, so we're trusted people advisors here to help in any way HR related that we can. Um, within the team, we have over 200 years of experience between us. So we can give you the best advice available and a good service. Um, and we can provide value to support in a range of different areas. So we have specialisms in, P, uh, in recruitment, training, coaching, wellbeing, reward, and many other people's strategies. So um, just quickly in terms of um, questions, um, if I find it easier, if you want to email me with any questions afterwards, otherwise it stalls the, uh, the webinar slightly. So if you have any questions, if you drop me an email, I'll come back to you um, in response to, to anything, any questions um, and my contact details are on the final slide at the end. Uh, I, there's also um, the Clover email address, info at cloverhr.co.uk, which will appear on all of the slides. If you wouldn't mind putting your speakers onto mute, I think possibly it does it automatically, um, to be honest, but just in case, um, that would be wonderful. And I will just go over briefly um, the contents of what we're going to be looking at today. So starting off with the law on this, this subject matter, um, because that is the foundation. Um, and then looking specifically at the role of line managers. Um, and that goes into a bit more detail in the circumstances of dealing with suspicion of a problem, dealing with disclosure of a problem, and then dealing with incidents within the workplace. Um, and then finally, I'm going to have a little look about how line managers can support a return to work um, following one of these events. Um, and we can't get through a webinar at the moment without discussing the impact of COVID-19. So we'll just have a, a little uh, look at that as well. So I'll just start off with a few stats um, because it's always interesting to have a look at the impact that um, this, this topic has. Um, so these stats are taken from a survey by the CIPD and they have, um, on this survey, they found that 40% of employers mention um, alcohol as a significant cause of low prod productivity. 35% of people say that they've noticed colleagues under the influence of drugs and alcohol at work. And 25% of people uh, on this survey said that drugs or alcohol had affected them personally at work. So alcohol and drug in use um, increases the risk of absenteeism, presenteeism, low productivity and inappropriate behaviour. It can impair performance at work through poor decision making and impaired reaction times causing lost productivity, errors and accidents. So we come on to just look at the, the background here and the law um, on managing drug and alcohol misuse. So there is a common law duty um, within law which is built on case law and that duty is the duty of care. Employers need to take reasonable care of their employees when they come to work. If they're in breach of this duty, the employees could claim negligence by the employer. So if an employer allows an employee to continue at work while under the influence of drugs or alcohol, there is at the very least a risk that the duty of care may be breached if nothing else more serious arises from this. The employer could also be vicariously liable for the negligence of that intoxicated person on site. So employees also have individual legal responsibilities in relation to their colleagues and their own health and safety. 
and they themselves could be sued for negligence alongside the employer. Um, so that is, again, if they fail to carry out their reasonable care to the, their, their colleagues um, by being under the influence of drink or drugs. It's worth noting as well that the law adapts and it can change and sometimes it takes a while to update, um, especially if legislation is changing as a result of case law. So employers really need to consider having a sensible workplace drug and alcohol policy in place rather than just relying on the law. Policies usually encompass a variety of stages um, Initially, they'd focus on employee protection, prevention, support and early intervention. But there also needs to be a procedure in place for dealing with the more serious aspects arising from substance abuse in the workplace. For example, if a specific incident does occur. So as with all policies, the employer needs to ensure that employees are aware of their policies and what they have in place as well as any disciplinary outcomes that may arise um, if an incident were to occur. So we're gonna look specifically now at the line manager's role in this, this process and in the, the process of following a policy or creating of a policy. Um, and what we've got here is just some recommendations really um, for the line managers to consider. So, Firstly, creating an environment where people feel able to ask for support and help. So knowing that people, to ensure that people know that they will be supported and to be able to signpost for help um, where it is needed. Key factor in this, and throughout we'll be talking about this, is having a policy available for reference. The policy not only explains the reason why a test might occur, whether that is random for course testing, there are a number of, of possibilities that you would put into a policy, which I, I won't go into full detail of today. Um, also look at the procedure for text, uh, testing. Um, it, it will provide in their details of the support available. And usually there'd also be an amnesty period um, prior to implementing the policy where people can come forward and ask for help. As a manager, you'd need to ensure that employees know that that support is available. And a large part of this is, is being upfront with employees, making sure that you're clear on the content of the policy so that you can pass that on to them as well. And particularly to make sure that, that support is communicated to the team um, and that they know how to access it. And this comes on to the, the next point as well about knowing where to get advice. So as a line manager, you should feel capable and confident to be able to manage and support employees. That doesn't mean that you need to be an expert in every aspect of this. So this is something where Clover HR can support. Um, we can provide help in implementing a policy. We can work in conjunction with an independent third party who would carry out substance testing and with occupational health providers to implement any recommendations of support for somebody who may be experiencing a problem. The next point we have here is avoid fueling a drinking culture. And it seems like common sense, but often it isn't. Um, oh, I have, somebody has just raised their hand. So I'm just gonna try and see if I can help. Oh, sorry. Uh, now this will, this will test me. Um, Hello, hi. You, hi. Can you hear me? I can, yes. So my question on awarding fueling a drinking culture, um, I come from an insurance company where, you know, we have a lot of um, our underwriters, for example, and brokers um, who are socially gathering, you know, say it could be lunchtime or after work, you know, with the clients and other brokers. and that's their job to build that relationship show, uh, socially. How, how can we address these issues where, you know, we are asking our um, employees to build those relationships and they're doing this by meeting and gathering socially at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I think, you know, it, you are going to have this, it, it is a difficult um, culture. It's kind of a difficult culture to break as well, because it, it you know, th this kind of socialising within the work environment and, and that enabling conversations is, is very prevalent. Um, I think it needs to be acknowledged that not everybody drinks. Um, and, you know, you, you may have a, a separate issue within that as well that um, you know, it, it may exclude some people from feeling that they can fulfill their role correctly. Um, so it, it's really, um, I think in cases like this, it's taking a common sense approach of, do you have a policy that says there can be no drinking um, during working hours? Do you say a drink at lunchtime is acceptable in a social occasion? However, if it, um, goes over a certain line then it causes a problem the issue you would have with that i suppose is is this a very separate um role that they're doing that requires them to to be socializing in which case do you then create a kind of two-tier system with it within your employees where some are allowed to drink in the day some aren't so uh, it it's a very interesting question it, it does create a lot of questions from it itself um so it's it's not a, an easy answer, I think, is the is the answer effectively. Okay. I think it would involve a lot of communication with the managers of the people being sent out to, to do these kind of meetings to find out, um, do they feel pressure to, to have these drinks? Is it affecting them when they come back to the office? Are they expected to come back to the office after having done this? Um, so I think the initial phase for this would be a conversation around those working practices. Okay, thank you for that. But um, my also concern was, um, how does it impact other employees where we have put a policy in place that, you know, drinking is not allowed and then when they see other employees who are going out and, you know, socially drinking because that's their kind of role to exactly. build I, I that relationship. I think this is the thing where, you know, my, my point about you, you risk with that creating kind of a yes. two tier society within the, the business. I, I think it, a lot of it comes back to going back to have those conversations about is this really a requirement as part of the role that they have to drink while having these social conversations? Sure. Is, it, is there a training need about making sure that people feel comfortable without having a drink to be able to do that kind of socializing? Um, all that kind of thing so I think it's it's a, a a cultural issue perhaps to look at within the business okay thank you okay um right I'll just just attempt to get myself back up and running I'm there uh, lovely okay Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. That was a really interesting question, actually. Um, and and hopefully I've given a bit of insight into, you know, the drinking culture and how it can call, cause a variety of issues. So um, when looking at this, um, I think the line manager really needs quite a lot of input into the creation of a policy so that a business understands where um, drinking may be part of a business culture and where whether there is a change that needs to be made looking at it there. Um, next point is supporting uh, rehabilitation. So it's important to be flexible and understanding about providing time off for someone who is getting treatment or is getting support relating to an alcohol or substance misuse problem. And it's been able to offer that flexibility to them and, and support that that goes a long way in showing an understanding of the situation. Um, and then finally, remembering each situation is unique. So if you're dealing with an issue, ask the individual about what support they need. Everybody's situation is different. Some people might require time out to get help. Others might just need some flexibility in working um, to attend appointments. And some people might require a role adjustment, um, such as addressing a high workload or stress levels. So, I'll come back again just to say Clover HR is experienced in dealing with these kind of scenarios and issues around substance abuse um, and we can provide support to managers in, in whatever form is needed in that. Right, so we'll move on to 
the next topic really on this is, is really how a line manager deals with the situation that may arise. So I'm going to take a look at a few kind of uh, the the main the three main scenarios that you will find with this um, for a line manager. So this isn't going into specifics. These aren't kind of um, example scenarios. These are looking at uh, firstly, if you have suspicion of a problem. Secondly, if a problem is disclosed to you. And thirdly, if there is an incident that needs to be dealt with. So firstly, we're talking about suspicion. So you might be concerned, you might become concerned that an employee has a problem with drugs or alcohol misuse outside of work. Now, this might be um, a rise to being alerted by change of behaviour, uncharacteristic actions, uh, a knowledge of their personal circumstances. If this does happen, um, you should start by making a note of any concerns that you have, any specific incidents that make you worried, um, so you can keep a, a, a record of your thoughts. And it's useful then to go back and look at actually, is this building up into a picture for me um, that I need to act on? Saying that, if the individual clearly does something that would warrant formal action, you need to escalate this as you would normally, regardless of, of your concerns, um, it, it will need to be addressed in, in the way that you normally would do, unless they have come to you and spoken to you. So if you do have concerns, um, if you have a policy in place, you might be able to perform a test on the individual if their action warrants it, or you might request that they, they take a test. Um, this is one of the benefits of having a policy already in place for, the, for this kind of situation. Um, and I'll deal with that uh, an incident again in um, a few slides time. But if you have suspicion without a specific incident, you should try and address your concerns with the individual. So with this, there's a need to balance confidentiality with the need to manage and communicate with colleagues who might become aware of a possible issue and that might be impacted by it by a health, from a health and safety perspective as well. So your goal is going to be to encourage employees to acknowledge that there's a problem that needs solving and you need to be seen to be firm but fair, demonstrating qualities such as concern, empathy, but also combined with practical and non-judgmental advice and direction. So this goes back to the previous slide about directing them in the right place for support. And the tone of discussion is, is really important, making sure you're not being confrontational or aggressive at all, um, because that is likely to drive the individual further into denial if that is, is a situation they're in. Um, I will go on to talk about um, a checklist, as you would, if, if you would, about um, having such a conversation in a, in a slide or so. Um, if a person denies that there is an issue and they're not prepared to discuss it with you, keep an eye on them there is potentially not a lot you can do at that point um but keep an eye on their behavior over a period of time that could be as short as over a couple of weeks and just see if the problematic behavior continues and if things don't improve perhaps have another conversation with them and retry that the approach of talking to them and just a point to note as well it's often the case that someone with a with a either real or a perceived problem might become the source of gossip or rumour. And sometimes this is the first way that you become aware of, of a potential issue. And it's important that you, you respond to these concerns, but at the same time, ensuring that confidentiality that I spoke of a moment ago, um, and making sure that gossip, which can be exaggerated or ill-founded, isn't influencing your decision, but you're taking more of an objective view of, of what is happening. So the next kind of scenario that you might face is where um, either you've spoken to an individual and they've acknowledged that there is a problem, or if somebody comes to you to disclose that they have an issue. Now, if you're the first point of um, implementing a policy, and it may be that you have an amnesty period, and this might be the point that people do come to you to disclose any issues that they might have as well. Um, so it is worth being prepared for that as well if you're implementing a policy. 
So just um, some tips to point out, and I apologise, I'm going to just quickly plug myself in. I've just had a battery warning, which would not be good um, if I suddenly disappeared. There we go. So points to, to consider. Um, ensure that it's kept confidential, and that is obviously vital. Don't discuss it with anybody unless it's necessary as part of a process to do that. And if you are going to discuss it with somebody as part of the process, make sure you're, you've informed that person, um, the individual that's come to you and disclosed the information, that you are going to be doing that. Um, for example, you may need to escalate it to somebody more senior to either authorise some support or um, ensure that some flexibility can be given, something like that. Secondly, um, make a clear note of conversations and the nature of the issues that are discussed. These can be very emotional conversations and sometimes we can lose track of, of the structure of the conversation. So it is important to have a, a note to be able to refer back to, to understand the key points of what you've discussed. Take action immediately if there are any safety critical issues. For example, if this person drives um, as part of their role, it might be that you need to adjust that for them. Um, and consider, consider any other health and safety implications. So are there any aspects of their role that they, they cannot um, be doing because it puts others or themselves at risk? So they, they must not be allowed to continue any act, activities that would pose a risk. And then finally, don't try and fix this problem by yourself, but encourage them to contact support services there are professionals available to be able to help them and assist them. Um, your role is to direct them to those people. Um, and again, having a clear policy in place will help how you can supply this information to them. Um, you will be able to have it readily at hand to give to them. So where you've had suspicion and spoken to an individual or where they've come forward and disclosed directly to you, I wanted just to go over a few points to consider when having a conversation with an individual. So these are largely common sense points, but I think it's always worth reiterating as part of going through the process of having a conversation. So firstly, avoid interruptions. Make sure your phone's switched off. No colleagues can walk in and interrupt. Ensure that they know they have your full attention. Be caring and compassionate. Ask simple, open questions such as how are you coping today? Uh, what can we do to support you? And avoid any kind of judgmental or patronising responses. Stay calm and speak calmly. Maintain good eye contact and listen actively and carefully. Encourage the employee to talk if they'd like to, but don't force it if they don't wish to. Be prepared for silences and be patient with that. And avoid making assumptions. Um, the individual is the best person to know what support might be best for them. And if there are agreed actions to help the individual, it might be helpful to follow up just in a supportive email. Um, and again, if you have a policy in place, make sure that they have a copy of that policy and you give them an opportunity to read that through and have bring any questions to you as well that they might have. And then we're going to look at now finally um, our third scenario of an incident occurring. So this will be where there's been no suspicion, no disclosure, but an incident occurs. So the later part of what I'll talk about in terms of the process here will be relevant um, also if somebody tests positive as part of a random testing programme which you might have in place. So this is where there's been no lead up to this, but an incident occurs. So how such an incident is dealt with will be made easier if you do have a policy in place and are able to easily access a drug testing professional services. So Clover HR can not only support in implementing and managing policy um, processes, but we also act with independent third parties who have recognised skill in drug and alcohol, um, drug and substance, sorry, abuse testing capabilities. 
So they will have all their processes, they will have all the equipment and they can guide you through um, the, the actual testing process. So an incident, it, we could be talking about anything from somebody comes to work smelling of alcohol, they come to work seeming visibly drunk or under the influence, or there's an accident at work that causes suspicion that they may be under the influence. The employer needs to take care not to make any assumptions, particularly unsubstantiated assumptions about an employee who it suspects to be under the influence. Um, but it is also very important to take precautions to prevent any danger to anybody else. Um, so it's a non-judgmental, but making sure that that person is taken away from colleagues um, and into a place of safety where they can't hurt themselves or anybody else. The, the type of action that's available to you as a manager will depend Firstly, whether you have a policy in place um, regarding the treatment of employees with a problem that arises, um, but also what your disciplinary pr process says about working under the influence of alcohol um, and whether you have re ready access to occupational health advice as well. Again, this is, this is the type of, of scenario where Clover HR would be able to step in and put in place a clear plan of action um, if such an event were to occur. So if you do have ready access to occupational health specialists or a third party who can test for substances, the employee could be asked to agree to be tested straight away. And then the results of such a test would show whether your suspicions were founded or not. If such a test isn't possible for a variety of reasons, the manager should look at, uh, uh, seek the opinion, sorry, of another senior person. So there are two sets of eyes on this scenario. Um, a record of observation should be made by both these people um, to look at what is being observed, what is the behavior, what are the concerns? And this will form part of the investigation into the event. The most appropriate course of action will then be to suspend the employee. Now, this would usually be with full pay unless the contract of employment specifically states that suspension in these circumstances would be unpaid. The employee's manager should make absolutely sure that the employee is not permitted to drive and, if necessary, make sure that they get a taxi um, to take them home and their car remains on the premises. Now, following the suspension, um, the employer should then carry out their investigation. Um, so you would hope that this would be able to be done quite swiftly, typically one or two days, and then the employee can then be recalled to the workplace to, uh, to attend an investigation interview, and this will establish their version of events. Depending on the, the outcome of the investigations, disciplinary action may follow. Alternatively, if it's established through the investigations that the has an alcohol problem, the employer may, depending on the policies and processes in place, offer a programme of support with a view to rehabilitation. Often this will be dependent on whether the employee has come to you prior to an incident occurring or the level of seriousness of the, the incident that has happened. Now finally, um, I wanted to look at supporting a return. So, and, and this is really because the, this webinar is focused on the line manager's role and the line manager plays such a pivotal role in providing ongoing support when an employee returns um, who has been getting treatment or support relating to uh, substance misuse. So as we said previously, every situation is different. So there's gonna be a, a broad spectrum to the amount of people um, about of time, sorry, people need off or the support that they need. Um, and as we've discussed previously, this will range from attending appointments, but remaining at work to taking leave to, to be able to get help to adjusting their job role. Around about a fifth of employees say that, uh, sorry, employers say that they provide paid time off for people uh, to get the support that they need. So it's not a large amount. Um, and it is something to think about in terms of the image of your business and, and what you are promoting in terms of well-being as to whether you are able to do that. 
individuals need to be spoken to about what kind of support they need um and again clover hr can help here in in looking at implementing flexible working adjusted duties etc so when somebody is to return following receiving support that isn't the end of it um around half of employers say that they don't provide any kind of return support service for employees for individuals who have taken time out to get treatment and then come back to the work workplace the return to work support provided is really important and often it will be the difference between whether somebody relapses or not um, in how supported they are when they get back to that those first steps of normality by by returning to work so this is an opportunity to consider things such as a phase return um, a support buddy managing conversations with that person making sure that there's frequent contact with them um, so that you're open to conversations with them. And also, again, you know, even though they've they've been through a process, perhaps it's still important to signpost helpful services and re resources and um, make sure that they are aware of where to get help, where to go to um, internally and externally as well. And so we come on to COVID-19 because we, we can't not really. Um, this has had a big impact on alcohol and substance misuse. And you'll notice this, the slide here is the same as the, the one when we're looking at line managers support because it is the same. It's still the same support that's needed. It's um, possibly just that this is going to be more frequent because of COVID-19. So, People have been experiencing anxiety and fear, both for their health and for their jobs. And this has really exacerbated a problem around drinking and drug misuse. And um, so the British Liver Trust reported a 500% rise in calls to its helpline help since lockdown started. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists have warned that additional services aren't equipped to deal with the rise in people drinking during the pandemic. Now, while people are working at home, it is really difficult to monitor their behaviours and especially behaviours that may already be hidden. So this is where the line manager needs to consider their role again. So again, open and honest conversations can only be had when there's a good working relationship and communication between manager and employees. Know what support's available and actively inform employees, regardless of whether you think there is a problem or not, or not. send information to people know what to do if there is a problem, know how to deal with that during this period where people are home working. Again, don't encourage a drinking culture. And this is things like um, Zoom drinks. Do we necessarily need to drink in, in Zoom drinks? You know, um, it should very much not be the focus of it if, if it is happening. Um, support, even though it's remote, uh, you still have a big impact on being able to provide support and again treating each situation as unique so lockdown presents its own set of unique circumstances and it's it's educating yourself in how to deal with those uh, circumstances that may arise and again this is where clover hr can come in as support to advise on a situation um whatever that may be So I'm just going to summarise. Um, employers have a legal responsibility to deal with drug and alcohol misuse in the workplace. Line managers play an absolutely vital role in creating a culture that's open and supportive. Suspicions need to be addressed and disclosure dealt with. And you need to be prepared to respond to an incident if it is to arise. And have means in place to support employees where, where possible. So thank you, everybody, for attending. I hope it was useful. As I said at the beginning, it is an absolutely massive subject matter. Um, and it, it's very interesting, um, but it is very sensitive as well. So um, it, it really is something that um, does require 
a fair amount of, of looking into to understanding, particularly if you're looking at implementing a policy. So again, as, as I've said, Clover HR are here to help um, with anything like that if needed. Um, and you have my contact details here, uh, also contact details um, on our website or to email the information email address. So thank you all very much for attending. And um, hopefully I shall see you soon on another webinar shortly. Thank you. Oh, I've just seen a question as well, asking if I'm able to share slides. The slides I believe will be available on our website. Um, so if you want to pop onto there, um, you should be able to get them from there. If not, um, if you drop me an email, I'll be able to send you something over. Thank you all again. And I've just seen a question as well from Lauren um, asking if you have suspicion of drink uh, drugs influence of work, can you force the employee to take a test? Um, no, you can't. However, um, the fact that they refuse to take a test can certainly be taken into account um, as part of the investigation. So um, it will depend on what your policy says. In some policies, it might state that if a person does refuse to take a test, then it will be considered as a positive test and dealt with on that basis. So I hope you're, you're still on here and, and got that answer. Thanks very much. <laughs>